welcome to the interesting podcast episode number 197. This episode is with the delightful and talented Andrew Duyon. He's a Cajun songwriter, singer, musician, and just an all-around good dude. In this episode, we talk about the intricacies of a Mardi Gras king cake, growing up playing baseball, learning to play guitar right-handed even though he's left-handed, his writing process, becoming a trio, making his different records, his upcoming tour, and so much more. Check out andrewduyon.com for dates of his new tour and tour, which, if you're listening to this on the day this episode drops, February 24th, 2023, that tour starts tonight in Macon, Georgia. Catch him on the road and strap in for a good time, friends. But before you do that, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 197, with Andrew Duyon. Theme song time. Doing, man i'm good how are you good how's your day going good i'm in a nice little phase of uh of, of kind of a, a home stand home life and it's it's uh getting up along the mardi gras parades here in new orleans so yeah you know it's a good time good time to be alive good time to be alive i know you're from new orleans what it what is the proper way to do mardi gras i've mm. never been give me give me sure. a give me a list here okay um well i think for starters not just doing Mardi Gras day is probably a good idea. Okay. Uh, probably getting, getting a taste of at least a French quarter parade, which is likely, you know, a walking parade, a smaller parade, as well as an uptown parade, uh, is a good idea. Uptown parade with the tractors and the big floats and whatnot. Cool. Um, you know, so doing both of those sort of parade elements and then Mardi Gras. So the weekend before Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras is fat Tuesday, right? Always on a Tuesday. So you have this weekend before every day has a big parade, a big to do. Um, you could think of it kind of if, if, uh, if, if all fellow Americans could relate to a, a big football game, there's always a lot of pre-gaming, a lot of tailgating, so to speak. Yeah. But instead of out in a parking lot necessarily, it might be on a neutral ground is what we call them, which is the median to other fellow Americans. Uh, it's, it's the, you know, the grassy knoll in between the two uh, streets and yes. you'll have people bringing all manner of couches or, you know, pop-up tents and making too much food. And um, <laughs> so you've got, you know, those sorts of hangs before the parade and you'll have a, an entire weekend of that Mardi Gras day, uh, I think it is the time to go into the quarter with, with your outfit. I think that's the time to kind of stay true to the age old tradition, which was, uh, you know, the God fearing, uh, Christians getting their rocks off before Lent. That right. was the whole idea with Mardi Gras. <laughs> so to be debaucherous in whatever way feels comfortable, uh, in terms of your, your, your outfit, you know, some sort of satirical, comment of the times is a great way to go for some outfit idea. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of, that's, that's the way to do the Mardi Gras day, I think is to go into the French quarter with your debaucherous attire. Okay. Okay. That's an album title, debaucherous attire. You know, it, it, uh, the I am's nice or the, you know, it, it rolls off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> What's the baby and the cake thing. Mm -hmm. Break uh, this down for me. I have no idea what that is. The king cake. All right. We're going to uh, we're going to arrive at an unpopular opinion from yours truly <laughs> <Okay>. here. But <laughs> before we get there, we can talk about the king cake being sort of the um a tradition that harkens back to the kingsman or the magi uh finding the Christ child, right? Okay. So, okay. You know, the idea is we're all eating the cake and someone will find the Christ child as oh. a miniature pre a plastic Christ child. Okay. In their mouth. So a little different. Oh, a little, little uh, different. But uh, yeah, it's uh, they'll do it 
on King's Day and and you know Mardi Gras is is uh you know the entire Mardi Gras season there are, there are king cakes everywhere and there are oh. too many people making king cakes for me to make this broad brush statement but I'm going to make it anyway <laughs> king cakes are are as a food item highly overrated ah they, okay they are just man it it well you know what I should say is there are good king cakes out there but sure. it's it's sad to me how many king cakes get away with being popular king cake brands oh. and, and sort of being, I would prefer a four day old cinnamon roll <laughs> to, to some of these king cakes. Oh, you know? no. <laughs> I, I think they're getting away with the tradition and doing some purple, green, and gold food colored uh, uh, sprinkles on top. And so it's a king cake, but the thing just ain't worth the calories and I ain't a calorie counter, but man, you just, some folks got to do better. That's all. Mm. You know, I, I respect that. They should respect the baby more and don't half-ass the cake. That's right. You know, uh, I'm, with, it, I'm with you, Andrew. I got your back on this. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been the one to find the baby? Oh, sure. Yeah. And I, I suppose I should mention that often the tradition, you know, when we were in school and somebody would bring a king cake to class the tradition was whichever kid got the baby, their parents were on the hook to bring the next king cake. Oh, no. It's so like a as sentence. a kid, yeah, that's right. As a kid, you were <laughs> pumped about it, but your parents probably hope you didn't get it. You know. I got the baby. No, you didn't. Give it to someone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give it to your buddy. That's so interesting. I have no concept of any of this. I'm, I'm learning a lot. Yeah. Where, where are you from? Uh, I, so I was born in North Carolina, but I was raised in Florida. I'm in Florida now. Yeah. What part? Uh, Naples. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot of golfers. A lot of golfers. Yeah. A lot of, yeah. that's, that's the only excitement you get here. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm excited to learn about King cakes and baby toys. Indeed. Yeah. So that's the thing at school. Okay. Okay. I feel like having a lot of King cakes like everywhere kind of takes away from them. Is there one giant King cake? Like a specific one? This is the one of Mardi Gras or everyone kind of mm -hmm. does their own version of it. No, I think everyone kind of does their own version. Mm. Um, okay, you know it, it. It it it's it's all playing on a fairly similar template. But gotcha. Uh, okay, you know, have you ever made one? I'm sure that I have. In fact, I'm sure that was a class project. Even you know, now we're getting oh. back to that childhood thing. Yeah, yeah. We we in school we would uh, there would be. I'm sure more than once we were tasked with making our own king cake, and once again. Highly subpar. <laughs> How do you, when does the baby go into the cake in the mix? Is there a specific time, like between the eggs and the flour? Certainly after the baking, being that it's plastic. Oh, they're that's gonna, right. Yeah. Can you tell I don't bake? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes um, these days you will see uh, the baby just in the box of the king cake, you know, maybe some people uh, don't actually want the fear of gnawing down on a, <laughs> on a, a little baby in their cake. So, right. you know. and then other folks, even, even, uh, further progressing the tradition have, um, added porcelain trinkets or different things, perhaps shying away from the the baby theme, but still having some little trinket if they want to introduce it into the cake. Oh, see, this sounds like a choking hazard. Oh, well, certainly. Yeah, I think. <laughs> That's part of the fun. It, it, and it is funny that that was never really, I don't ever remember anybody mentioning, you know, we could have been at a birthday party in February <laughs> or something and running around with a king cake. No, no one ever said, you know, be careful, you know, don't take too big a, a bite, you know, uh, right. it, that was never actually mentioned. You're right. It's kind of a, one of those things. I think deep down, they're like, you're either going to find Jesus in the cake or you're going to meet him. <laughs> That's it. You're going to find <laughs> Jesus one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> How young were you when you started playing baseball? Oh, baseball. Yeah. Um, do I know things, Andrew, or do I know things? Yeah. You've, 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 uh, you've checked up on me apparently. <laughs> baseball Maybe. was, was my first love. And, yeah. um, it's, I'm sure, you know, four or five would have been the first year that you go to the playground and play with other kids, you know, whack the ball off of a tee. And, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, into high school years, you know, made the, the local high school team, which, you know, at the time was pretty cool because, yeah, strangely, they had sort of a, I don't remember what, what publication, but they would rank 
high school teams, which was impossible because <laughs> none of these teams really play each other. Right. But I think they were basing it off of, you know, which teams had a handful of good looking college prospects, you know, but anyway, sure. my, my team was ranked in the top five or so in, in the state. Dude. And uh, yeah, it was a great team. Now I mostly rode the bench. I was a pitcher who was constantly <laughs> injured. Classic. But, uh, of course. Yeah. But you know, before, before my prospects of being a left-handed pitcher became oh. bleak due to my rotator cuff, Mm, I thought that, yeah, totally. Um, I thought, I thought, you know, I'd go to a small college and figure out life from the dugout, but mm -hmm. uh, that was not to be. And so I, uh, you know, it, it became clear that another hobby would have to take baseball's place. And I picked up a guitar as the first notion thinking, well, that's, that's what dudes who go to college do, you know, don't they <laughs> strum on a guitar or something? You're not wrong. But uh, yeah. So, you know, it was kind of, it was probably a surface inclination at first, but it was serendipitous because I think I, it was a perfect storm, a moment of being hit with uh, the Delta blues and Greenwich village folk music at the time. I was just figuring that stuff out. And yeah. I also had the best educator I think that I had through high school and college uh, was a fella named Mr. Rosso in our English class who uh, it was American literature and poetry, but that stuff was so important to be introduced to, uh, you know, to recognize things that were greater than the sum of their parts just in a sentence, you know, and I started to pay attention, I think, at that point. Yeah. And isn't it crazy when you think back, like how important an educator is? in like affecting your life into something that if it had been that person, you might not have been as interested. Yeah. And, and I'm calling myself out now because Mr. Rosso is out there somewhere and I still haven't reached out to say that, <laughs> you know, I, I might be, you know, a chemical engineer or something that right. uh, highly undesirable, not to say no, no offense to chemical engineers. <laughs> no, um, but you know. specifically would make an undesirable one. Yes. Yes. I, I get I, it. I, I would be the undesirable <laughs> part of the chem chemical engineer. Yes. <laughs> There's Nobel Peace Prize and there's Walter White. The spectrum is long. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. You can use this for good or for evil. Yeah. <laughs> As with most things, I find. Without doubt. Yeah. So you you said you were a left-handed pitcher? Yeah. I yeah. don't know. I know pretty much nothing about baseball. Sure. Do you were you assigned that position or did you like go down until you found one that like, oh, this kind of works? So the interesting thing about being left-handed on the baseball field is there are four positions of the nine nope sorry five all right let's get this right there's sure. nine positions i know on the zero field. <laughs> <laughs> there's nine positions on the field you can technically be an outfielder that's three as a okay. lefty you can be a first baseman that's four you can be a catcher that's five and you can be a pitcher that's six okay so you can be uh, the outfielder that was never in the in the cards for me i was first base for a while but the thing was you're limited uh as a lefty you can't play third base, you can't play second base, and you can't play shortstop um, gotcha. simply because of the mechanics of fielding a ball and then needing to throw it to first base or to second base. Mm, you're angles. just you're you're kind of yeah, you're kind of backwards. So uh first base was the thing for a while, but you know, pitching uh once kids started pitching, you know, that in that age, it was something that I needed to try as a lefty. You know, there it's it's said that. As a left-hander, you have certain advantages, you know, the the idea that a, a batter steps up to a left-handed pitcher and it, it looks a little squirrely to them as opposed sure. to a right-handed pitcher. So, um, and you know, that became the thing. Huh. Are you left-handed or just on the field? Yeah, I am left-handed in everything except playing guitar. That, okay, that makes way more sense because I've watched all of your videos. I've listened yeah. to every one of your songs yeah. and I've seen you play guitar. And I was like, that, you're not playing left-handed. So when you said left-handed on the field, I'm like, what? Yeah. Hold on a sec. Am I getting my wires crossed? <laughs> sure. Well, and that there was there was reason for that. I had played, obviously, baseball, but also golf as a kid. And going to the pro shop and trying to pick out a, a baseball mitt or a golf club, you're looking at a wall full of baseball mitts. And there might be two right at the bottom that are lefties, if you're lucky. But wow. I just... I couldn't, I didn't want to imagine bringing myself because I had seen a wall full of guitars even before I could play one. Yeah. I didn't want to have to look at a wall full of guitars, just like I looked at a wall full of mitts and a wall full of golf clubs. 
and not be able to play any of them. So yeah. I called up the local shop and luckily, I don't know, you know, California Ron answers the phone and I said, <laughs> Hey man, you know, I'm lefty, but can I learn right hand? And he's like, yeah, man, you could, you could totally do it right handed, man. Give it a shot, man. And I, whoever that California Ron guy was, I, <laughs> I have to thank him because to this day I can walk into a pawn shop or a guitar shop and I can play most of the guitars. What a beautiful thing. Wow. It's like, cause there's been a lot of musicians. I think, I mean, Hendrix like just flipped his strings upside down mm -hmm, and one of right. the Beatles played left-handed. That's true. And you, you kind of went the other way around. You're like, I'm going to learn right-handed even mm -hmm. though you're left. Wow. I'm going to get it wrong. I think it was Albert King who simply played with the strings upside down. Ooh. That's just wild. But um, yeah, no, you're right. Uh, Jimi Hendrix simply strung the guitar uh, the opposite way, which you could do, right? I mean, you could technically as a lefty play any of the guitars in the room. You just have to take all the strings out and put them the opposite way. Um mm -hmm. But, you know, in, in the sense of being able to walk into a room and, and pick up a guitar and, and play it, I'm glad I play right-handed. And and thinking about the dexterity, yeah, you know, for your sure. left hand plays on the fretboard, right? It, it's mm -hmm. it's barring the chords. It's it's While your right hand is strumming, which can be as simple as almost flapping your hand in control. Yeah. How is it that this is the right-handed way to play guitar. <laughs> I'm, I'm dexterous in my left hand, and that's where it seems like the dexterity needs to come to play guitar. Yeah. I don't know. I It worked well for me, and I, I don't envy right-handers for learning right-handed. It seems crazy to me. That is kind of weird. I've never thought about that. You're doing way more work with your left hand. Totally, yeah. Wow. I love that you just figured it out. Did you Did you pick it up quickly, or did you have to, like, was there a learning curve? I think it took time, but I remember as a kid, you know, my mom sent my sister and I to piano lessons and it was several months before my sister and I banded together and mutinied against the <laughs> piano lessons. There you go. It, it was, it was because we were being taught how to read sheet music before we could really play the instrument. Oh and, yeah. You know, I, that was probably still in me when I picked up a guitar and I just wanted to learn three chords and play something that sounded like a country song or a Hootie and the Blowfish song or something. Just yeah. let me, let me get through something and hear something back that I recognize, create something that I can, you know, that I can recognize. And, you know, I think that's what keeps you going, you know? Totally. Once you've, once you've done one path, you're like, Oh, okay. Then it makes a lot more sense. You have that foundation. And with yeah. three chords, you can play like every popular song ever. Yeah, it, it, it feels like work until you feel like you're being musical in, in even the simplest form. And then suddenly you're buoyant. It doesn't feel like work anymore and you're excited to move forward, you know? Yeah. What was harder to learn, a guitar, the way that your hands work, or a harmonica? The guitar was harder. I mean, I'm, I just fake it till I make it on the, on the <laughs> harmonica. I, it sounds good. Thanks. Well, you know, it, it's, it's a nice, it's an accessory. You know, sure. I think there are harmonica players out there. Oh, for sure. Um, but but I, I use just because, you know, Bob Dylan was important early on and mm -hmm. and it it's a nice it's a nice sound to hear an acoustic tune um with some harmonica accompaniment. But I was delivering pizzas in college and drove with one hand and used the other hand to mess around on the harmonica while listening to some C D that Hopefully I could find a song in the key of G or key of C or something <laughs> and uh, just fumbled my way around. But that instrument is, it is a fairly simple instrument. You know, the, the harmonica, you know, I've traveled around with four or five of them because I need one in each key of uh, whatever song or the second position of whatever songs that I intend to play them on. Sure. You know, I can't play a song in D on a B flat harmonica or something, you know, it's, right. it's, uh, it's sort of, it's sort of mapped out for you in, with that instrument. So someone who is completely, uh, uh, new to the, to the instrument could feel musical fairly quickly. I bet. How long was it before you could play both at the same time? Cause my brain doesn't comprehend mm. being able to do that. Yeah. I, I think the, the muscle memory of strumming a guitar you know, that had been around for at least a couple of years by the time I 
you know, bought one of the harmonica racks, right. That mm-hmm. you, you wear so that you don't have to hold the harmonica. Right. But you know, I think it just, it starts slow. It starts with almost just blowing a breath haphazardly into the harp while strumming a fairly simple progression. And when that becomes easier, then maybe you start bending notes and going for single note runs on the harmonica while, you know, uh, making it through a progression with ease. It's, it does feel kind of like if each hand is juggling uh, two, let's say each hand is juggling two batons, it does feel kind of like you, you keep the two batons in your right hand not moving. You're focusing on the left hand, juggling those until you feel like you've got that so much that you don't worry about it and you focus on the right. And now you've got them both going. And if you want to make a different kind of move on one hand, that's the hand you're focusing on, trusting that your muscle memory has kind of got the other hand. And I think that's what it comes to with the guitar and the harmonica. If there's a cool little warble or draw note bend that you're doing on the harp, then you're probably not doing anything too interesting on the guitar because that's the part that's just muscle memory. You're forgetting about that part, you know? Gotcha. Okay. It's like I hear like in martial arts, they have a thing called conditioned reflex response. Hmm. You do it so many times that you don't think about it. It just happens. Same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So when, when did you start writing music? Let's see. I mean, there, there was that, high school revelation of, you know, poetry, American literature, it was immediate to me drawing the conclusion of these lines and poems that were greater than the sum of their parts and Mm -hmm. Delta blues specifically and the sound and the simplicity of the line and the music being greater than the sum of its parts. It was clear to me that this stuff is important both because it is written and because it has experience behind it it has for me it was pain that i appreciated yeah that felt like it had pain behind it like someone had to suffer to have written this yeah um, uh, i love the line that i've learned from somebody in nashville and i'm not sure who said it but they said a good song has to cost you something Ooh, and i love that yeah you know, the, the, uh, another line that i would kind of counterbalance that against is a good song is either clever or true the clever oh. ones, the clever ones don't have to cost you anything, but the right. true ones do. And the, that's what I'm after, you know, um, yeah. the, what, what I think is important in my pursuit is finding the true ones, the ones that cost me something. Um, and so when did I start trying to figure that out? Um, it was before college, it was during high school, you know, I had picked up the, the guitar and I think once I learned a few chords, then, you know, uh, attempting to write something uh, became, you know, a habit. But that was as rudimentary as, as like a baby learning to speak. You know, I'm yeah. sure that it was not useful. In the, the songs I, I was writing didn't see the light of day and didn't sure didn't deserve to for a while, I'm sure. But they laid the foundation for what was to come. Certainly, you know, it, all those all those steps crawling before you walk and that whole thing. Yeah, like a baby. Like Look a at baby. this, Andrew. Like wow. a king cake baby. <laughs> yeah. Had you been singing before this, or that was just the natural progression of we have an instrument, we have words, now we have to sing? Yeah, I I don't I wasn't a singer. You know, I sang like a, a kid who went to Catholic school and probably was in the choir and did a little theater sang, but no, sure. I, I I wasn't a singer. Uh, I remember being in the far room figuring out guitar and trying to sing and hearing my sister laughing in the kitchen or snickering. <laughs> Not, you know, As they do. It, involuntarily. I don't think, you know, it wasn't, she wasn't trying to be mean about it, but you know, it was Siblings. a memory. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it. It was a memory of recognizing that it's not like I opened my mouth and, and it was immediately apparent I could sing, but right. you just, you keep at it. And I feel lucky to have rendered a voice that is believable you know, when I'm trying to sing these, these written songs, you know, is it one? So it was one of those things you had to kind of find your own sound like over time, like, let me try this and stretching a little bit until you kind of settled into it without doubt. And I think it's an ongoing process. The, the, the imagery, I like imagery. I don't know if you could tell 
Uh, <laughs> I'm a fan the, as well. <laughs> yeah. The, the image I like to think of when it comes to like finding a voice or what, what it is that I'm portraying is when I started, you know, what was it? It was, it was Bob Dylan and it was Leighton Hopkins. It was big pieces of these guys who I kind of like took parts of and put them together in a portrait such that the pieces were so big that you can clearly see that this is Bob Dylan piece and this is Light and Hawkins piece. But then you keep getting influenced and there's more pieces. And so all of the pieces become smaller in the portrait that you have more options. And that way it beca- becomes almost a pixelate, pixelated version of you. You start to see yourself in there until it gets m- higher and higher in definition. And maybe you can't quite pick out which parts are influenced by who anymore. It just starts to look more and more like you. And maybe that image of yourself helps inform where you go from there, less so than directly the the inspiration. But I think to this day, inspiration is so important. I can hear a song and dig it. I'll go look up the chords just to find the changes that might have been interesting to me that I might not have intuited myself. Uh, and that that can be good enough to start me on the road to a new song, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the beauty of art, right? Is inspiring other artists to be like, oh. oh. Yeah, that's it. And everything's been done before. So that's the point right. is to build up on things. There's only 98 keys on a piano. There's that's so it. much you can do. <laughs> yeah. And in that sense, I, I think it's important for me to admit that I don't call myself a musician. You know, I'm a songwriter. Yeah. As you said, everything musically... Anything musically I will ever do has been done because I I work from a fairly simple uh, uh, place when it comes to the music part. It's it's what is it that I have to say? That's the question. Can I can I add anything to this conversation? That's the most important piece for me, and that's why I call myself a songwriter and not a singer songwriter or a musician. Yeah, interesting. So how long was it after you're practicing and kind of figuring yourself out before you started playing for people? Yeah, let's see. I think I, I I first started playing for people regularly at the open mic during college. Nice. Um, yeah, let's see. So that was, you know, that that was uh that was an attempt to play to the sorority girls at the Mellow Mushroom where there the you open go. mic was. You know, I <laughs> and it was a it was a whole scene, man. It it was uh, people came out for that thing, but everybody was playing cover songs, you know. Uh, sure, people might sneak in a, an original here and there, but it was really about you know playing songs that people could sing along to, and I I did plenty of that, mm-hmm. you know, and and I you know that was that was my job uh, for a while after college when I was just figuring out if I could make a living. Uh, uh, playing songs. You know, it started with four hour gigs along the Redneck Riviera, as we call it, the the Gulf Coast. Um, nice. Just, you know, every other song was a, you know, an Otis Redding song or something. Yeah. That <laughs> ilk. Uh, and I'd sneak in my songs when it felt right. But, but you know, it, until I was making records and could sell a ticket to a show, Mm-hmm. You know, I, it was more important that I played something that people were familiar with than uh, playing my own stuff just then, you know. Sure. Got to get them in the door first. That's it. Were you nervous? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, when I first started, yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's innate for everyone who creates to want the spotlight, you know, right. quite quite the opposite. I think you might be under your little work light in your room, very passionate about some creative work. And then when it comes time to not only share it, but but claim it, that can be a, a troubling idea. And I think it took me a while to feel comfortable with the idea that I would be on a microphone. It, it I can I can effortlessly close my eyes and sing a song. Sure. That that part is is I don't mean effortlessly like like that's how talented I am. I mean <laughs> right. I, I mean I mean I <laughs> takes away that, the nerves a little bit. Yeah, that part feels good to me always. When I close mm-hmm. my eyes, and I often do, that's that part is natural to me. But the fact is, when you finish that song, you will then have to open your eyes <laughs> and think of something to say in between right. those songs. 
And I think that part, as we call it, the banter, took me a while to figure out who who do I want to be here? Who, how much of myself and and what what needs to exist in between these songs to serve this set to make this performance work? You know, and that that took a while, and it, that continues to evolve. As it should, I think that's how art works. You want to be constantly growing and trying things, and because there's some, it's a difference between doing something that you just really enjoy on your own than pursuing it professionally. Do you remember when that switch happened of like, I'm going to, I'm going to go for this. Cause when you add commerce to art, things can get a little weird. Uh, without a doubt. Um, so, you know, there I am last semester of college and it was clear to me that I wanted to give this music thing a shot for a year. Classic. See what happens, you know, because, cause you know, what are the chances? Right. And, uh, you know, and, and let's be reasonable. And I got to make a buck eventually. Do I want to be a starving artist forever? And But the thing was, I I, I had a, enough little moments of buoyancy or lifts up that I never really had to question it. I never really had to look back. And that was a credit to things like meeting a bar tender or a bar owner, rather, at uh, one of the open mics in New Orleans and him asking me if I'd play once a week at his bar. Nice. And suddenly I have a steady gig. And then he says a, f- a few gigs into that, okay, now I want to know how to invest in you. Dude. Uh, and so I said, you know, I, I don't know, but I think I think we should make a record and you should pay for it in exchange for a percentage of those record sales, you know, some sort of record contract. So we went to Loyola University here in New Orleans, and with the help of a couple of excellent professors who uh, were so generous with their time, George Howard and John Snyder, um, we figured out how to make that independent record contract, and he helped me record my first album. You know, the, those really? pieces, yeah, th- I mean, that's that's what made it easy enough to look at myself in the mirror and say, yeah, of course you keep going, you know? That's amazing. Yeah. It really, that really is what it takes, right? It's like one person to believe in you and you're like, oh, that's, that's enough fuel for quite some time. Certainly when the, <laughs> when the one person has a, an investment they want to make. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand. They double believe in you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you know, you could have several elements of praise, but one person has a critique and somehow your self-doubt will hang on to that. Oh yeah. You know, there were 50 pieces of, of praise <laughs> that you forgot about, you know. Why are artists like this? What's wrong uh, with us, Andrew? <laughs> yeah. You know, the things that I love have clearly been gone over and over again by someone who cared a lot about them yeah. until, until they just mattered more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then they cost that person something. Yeah. Um, so what's wrong with this? I don't know. I think, I think <laughs> we're just willing to like put in the pound of flesh to create something that matters to somebody else that can serve someone else. I love that. Was that, was that album, the songs I wrote before I knew you? Yeah. That first one is the one he, he uh, help me make how cool is that like to just now i love the album even more nice because the backstory of like dude that's so cool yeah that was a a special deal and uh and his investment allowed me to shoot for uh, a a real bona fide producer yeah uh her her name was trina shoemaker oh amazing and and she had you know won several grammys doing her thing with cheryl crow and others Mm -hmm. um but but her name was familiar to me because my cousin, who was an audio engineer and who I had made demos with, had introduced me to this person, Trina Shoemaker. And so I went to him and said, look, I, we have some money to make a record. Maybe, a, you know, so I wrote a, a note to Trina Shoemaker. And a week later, she called me up and said the songs were delightful and she loved to make the record. And so we went to uh, Nashville and made that first record. And that was the first of three, I believe, that I've made with Trina, because I think she really she just understands uh where this singer songwriter fella is coming from. Yeah. Um, You know, and I, it's such a precious, delicate thing to take my, my brooding little (laughs) singular voice in my room with my acoustic guitar and then bringing it into that studio where red light syndrome for one, you know, that red light comes on and, and you tighten up. How do you loosen from that? How do you give it into the wires but then also there's a blossoming that's going to happen. You, you're going to add a band to this song, or maybe you've been playing it with a band on the road these days, but but there might be other options. So how do you navigate all of this 
with, you know, inside of a studio that's costing you $800 an hour, you know, right. <laughs> not, yeah. not stressing about that. <laughs> no pressure. Um, yeah. So <laughs> pre-production is, is something that's become uh, an important lesson to learn, you know, do, do as much pre-work as you can, but at the end of the day, there is a blossoming that's going to happen in the studio and how do you cultivate it? How do you trim it? How do you make those decisions? You know, and, and I think Trina was an important person to to know and to help me make those records. That's cool. It's like a trial by fire, but with a guide. Indeed. Yes. Yes. Someone who knows the forest as the whole thing is burning down. Yeah. How long did it take you to make that first album? Like once you decided we're making an album? Shoot, that was so long ago. I'm not certain, <laughs> but I know that we had... Does it feel quick or did it feel like it took forever? Well, the studio time was quick. I think it was three days in the studio. Okay. There was one day of rehearsal before that. Smart. You know, it would have depended on Trina's schedule at the time. When could she get together? She also had to put the band together because then I didn't have a band. She hired uh, some fellas oh, right. from Boston who were all great. Billy Conway being one of them who's since passed uh, a great guy uh, was the drummer for morphine. Dude. Uh, he was sageful in, in who he was and and how he, you know, how he interacted not only musically, but interpersonally. Um, I still appreciate him pulling me aside after, after we were done that, that third tracking day and we were outside and it was dark. And he said something like, you know how I know, you're going to make it. It was cooler than that. That's not what he said. <laughs> but, uh, he In said a sage way. Like, he's, yeah, something like, you know, I know you're going to be okay because on the first day of our rehearsal, I watched you in the booth sing these songs for rehearsal and you sang them the same way with your eyes closed as you did in the studio, tracking it to be, you know, the reference forever. Uh, uh, and, and it's, you know, I can tell that you believe in it that way. And, and, uh, that, that was important to hear from someone like him who had clearly been down the road a long, long way and kept his eyes and heart open for the whole thing. You know, I love those kind of moments, like just in life, the real, like, I don't know, it's like a real human moment along your journey of like this, this talk about stuff that matters that mm -hmm. that's something that sticks with you for a very long time. Yeah, nearly as much as uh, a critical comment on Instagram. It'll stick with you <laughs> nearly as much as that. Very close, <laughs> very close race. <laughs> no, th those are, you're right. Those are the feathers in the cap that, you know, if there are ever elements where self doubt gets the better of me, I do remember moments like with Billy. Yeah, for sure. So, how long was it from releasing your first album to when you're like, I've, I think I'm on a tour? This seems like the thing to do. I was thinking the other day about how stressful it was to book our record release show. Mm -hmm. We ended up getting the date at a uh, one of my favorite spots in town, DBA. But it was tough before that because I was an unproven quantity. Nobody knew my name, and mm -hmm. who's going to book, you know, a show, perhaps with not a whole lot of lead in time. So I was glad to get that show. But what happened after that? Did we tour? I'm sure. I'm sure I did a bit. But, um, you know, back then I, I didn't have a booking agent for sure. And, you know, I'm an unknown quantity in all of these places. Uh, and I'm certain I probably couldn't sell very many tickets in any of them. So it was house shows. It was coffee shops. It was listening rooms. It was sports bars where they leave the TV on while you play. <laughs> you know, um, yep, the proving yeah. grounds of every musician. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, I'm sure I toured a bit after that first record, but uh I'd say the past three to five years have really started to feel like we can book a tour and promote a tour and people come out to see those shows and it serves us and it serves them. And it feels really, really good to do that. What was it like playing for like American audiences versus like when you did your first like UK tour? I think what's nice about UK touring is on every one of those posters, I said, you know, we listed Andrew Duhon. New Orleans songwriter, you know, and yeah. <laughs> might as well make New Orleans songwriter as big as Andrew Duhon because there you go. they don't know that name, but they know what New Orleans songwriter might be. And that yeah. might, might be a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there was something, I think just like if I was at my local here in New Orleans and a guy with bagpipes showed up and started playing, I would immediately stop whatever conversation <laughs> I had and I would listen because I don't hear bagpipes. And I think in a similar way, I can go to a small town pub in, you know, 
Suffolk, England, and I will start playing and they will immediately recognize it as something different, something foreign enough that it might be fascinating and they'll give it a little bit more of a chance than I think an American crowd, you know, might give it on first listen. So that it was, and and also I found it was always solo traveling and the train system in England tickets were cheaper, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was also great too, because in traveling, I was simply looking out of the window and writing in a journal. And I think a lot of songs came from those travels. I think the second record came from those travels and uh, just being able to pay attention and be quiet on a solo journey. Uh, that, that was, that was a nice way to do it. Yeah. Really soak it in. Yeah. And then when you came back, was this around the time that you became a trio? When did we become a trio? Hmm. I'm trying to remember in my timeline. Oh. So was it be- was it before the moorings? You know what? Moorings would have been when we became a trio. Let's see. So uh-huh. I had I had a drummer who flaked. That and I needed happen. a new drummer. So I, you know, I made some, you know, calls around town and found a guy. His name was Max Zimanovic. So he came and recorded with us. And this other guy who I'd been meaning to play with, but it was kind of his first rodeo with us too, with me too. Uh, Miles Weeks on upright bass. Amazing. Uh, we they they were amazing, and and uh, we started to tour as a trio after that, um, and that was a beautiful thing. Um, now, let's see. It was three years later. Now, and I have to give it up to Max and Miles. That trio, it just felt like we had just enough wanderlust and. They didn't bust my balls all that much about the fact that we were out there, you know, underpaid and just on the <laughs> journey. <laughs> sure. You know, because th- that's a thing that might be looked over, but I bet we're going to these places and the marquee always has my name on it. You know, it's not like we didn't think of some cool band name and we show up and we all feel collectively equal parts of it. Sure. I- I, I, my ego, my selfishness says I'm writing these songs, right? And, <laughs> and, and that's my name up there. So I'm asking these guys to come play my songs. And I, if there is, you know, anything that supersedes things like what Billy said, it's that musicians as talented as Max and Miles and later Jim Kolachek, who can play with anybody, are willing to get into a van to go play my songs wherever yeah. we're going. That, that is the most encouraging thing I've experienced. But uh, we we toured for about three years after the moorings, and we went to Nashville to make a record called False River. Mm-hmm. And the producer of that record, Eric Massey, uh, was aware that Miranda Lambert was looking for a drummer, and there was Max doing his thing, certainly one of the most talented musicians I've ever played with, knowledgeable for sure. And he made that connection. Max got a uh, a, a rehearsal, uh, sorry, an audition with Miranda and he's touring as Miranda's drummer to this day. Dude. So, yeah. You know, it's uh, it kind of felt like that was where we sent Max off after we somehow fortuitously found him while he was in new Orleans. Yeah. He, he had actually chased a girl from classic uh, China. Whoa. Uh, they, they had a gig together in China and he, she was from new Orleans. And so she, he came back to new Orleans with her. They didn't last, but we did. We played for <laughs> three more years, and and uh, and then he was off with Miranda. So, um, you know, we Miles and I understood what we had with Max, and I think when when Max jettisoned, it wasn't it, it was perfectly natural. You know, I I can't even selfishly say I was bummed about it. I thought Max deserved that gig, but I think Miles and I both recognized that was something really special. We're going to be a duo hiring some guns on drums until we figure something else out. Uh, that was our plan. And somehow, seamlessly, we meet a guy named Jim Kolachek, who's living in Lafayette, three hours away, who happens to be incredibly knowledgeable about music in general. And have, In fact, he was teaching a history of music class at U- University of Lafayette at the time. Dude. But he's also a drummer who sings like a bird. And um, we started playing with him. And... I couldn't believe how that trio feeling moved on seamlessly, fairly seamlessly, you know, after Max, you know, we thought it would take some time to figure that out, but Jim has been, uh, you know, a beautiful element to 
what was previously a beautiful trio uh, before Jim is now a beautiful trio again, thanks to Jim. Love stories like that. Yeah, sometimes it works out. Sometimes it does. And I love it when like, yeah, that sort of mesh of like, I imagine with the trio, with your name on the billboard, there is a, like there has to be a personality thing to where it just works. It's on the same wavelength. They're like, you have to make music together, literally and metaphorically. It's pretty, It's that's very special. I feel like that's pretty rare. In that sense, you know, I think the personalities exist too, you know, on the stage and then at the meet and greet, people start, I mean, Miles has been in the band for a long time now, right? Mm-hmm. people are bummed if Miles can't make a show. If they thought Miles is going to be there and he's not, you know, people are like, oh man, where's Miles? You know, they want to they yeah. see him after the show. They want to see him joking around on stage. Like the personalities of these, there's only three people. You know, we're not talking about a seven piece band here. Yeah. There are three people to focus on. And so their energies, their personalities become part of the show, I think, you know? Yeah. Were, was there any pressure making like making a second album? Because the first one, you kind of set the bar. And then you're like, all right, let's make another one. Like, how did you not compare the two? Or did you feel like you had to live up to the first one making the second one? Yeah, I think every record, I feel like I need to do better than the one before. Makes sense. I feel, well, you know, it's the 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 piece that's maybe subtly difficult is you've got from birth to deciding to make a record to write that first record. <laughs> Good, point. Good point. Good and point. And then that next one's going to come a year and a half to three years in succession, you know, and it it does kind of feel like after you make a record, it's like you, you, you're emptying out this, this fieldsman's bag of, of what you've reaped. And it's just, it's empty by your side, which feels great, but it also feels a little naked. Like, yeah. Oh, oh, I gotta, I gotta go back out there and start over. Right. You know, we got to keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you know, so um, there, there's certainly that feeling for every, every consecutive record. Um, but the second one, we were lucky to get uh, out of nowhere a Grammy nomination for Best Engineered Album. Yeah, you um, did. And uh, I remember I was playing a gig somewhere in Alabama, as you do. You As know, you do. I've played a lot in Southern Alabama, made a lot of friends down there. Uh, there I was. I was in somebody's guest house or guest room. And I, it, it was there was Twitter. I was on Twitter at the time. I think it was pretty hip back then. Mm-hmm. And uh, somebody said, congratulations on the nomination. And he was the guy who had pressed the actual vinyl of the record. And Oh, cool. I didn't, I didn't know what he meant. I'm sure he was part of the Grammy organization is probably how he knew so soon. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I started to search around Twitter and try to figure out what he was talking about and somehow figured out the record was nominated for a Grammy, which I didn't believe <laughs> until the morning. Sure. Um, but Gotta sleep it off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, I got on the phone with, with a good, smart music business friend the next morning. And, you know, he said, what do you think this means? And I said, I don't I don't know what it means. I think it means that we played well enough that we didn't distract from Trina Shoemaker's ability to engineer <laughs> a great record. There you go. You know. But wow. that that was a little piece, you know, in this day and age when it is so easy really to make a record. Um you you kind of you wish and you beg for some reason that to give people to pay a little bit extra attention to listen to three songs instead of half of one, you know? And yeah. so yeah, I didn't watch the Grammys the other day, but they remain this, this uh, badge that gives you relevancy and uh, it turns more ears toward you. And I think that that is something that I can admit I am ambitious or, or, or remain to have ambition for is finding more ears to play these songs for, uh, cause they're, you know, they're not, it's not that everybody's supposed to dig it. It's just that too many times people have told me that a certain song has served them in such a way that it feels to me like this is, this is why it, it matters, you know, um, to write songs. And so to be able to play these songs for some more people and have them serve someone else, that's, that's what it's all about at this point. Yeah. And also, I mean, dude, that's such a big deal. 
Like if someone is nominated for an Oscar for the rest of their lives in the trailer, it says Academy Award nominee. Hmm. You know, and the Grammys is the music version of that. We should we should make this uh, this distinction. If the record is nominated for a Grammy, it doesn't mean that I am a Grammy nominated artist. Right. It means that the record is Grammy nominated. Indeed. Um, so I don't ever claim to be a Grammy nominated artist because that's not true. <laughs> now, right. when promoters want to say it all the time, I don't correct them because <laughs> you know, they're using that badge to promote the show. And that's the whole idea. But sure. Uh, you know, in, in fact, you know, I'm not a Grammy nominated artist. Just that record was nominated. Correct. Yeah. If we have to split hairs, <laughs> yeah. your we album should. is we should absolutely- be fair. We should indeed. I agree. Yeah. The the album The Moorings by Andrew Duyon is Grammy nominated. Indeed. Yeah. And your name's on your name's on the sticker, pal. Yeah. Way to pronounce Duyon correctly. Good for you. Where'd you get that? I do research, Andrew. That's very well done. Wow. I practiced for a week. <laughs> yeah. it's uh when i'm playing shows in lafayette it's kind of like you know that's i gotta take in my moment in the car to remind myself that it's do y'all you know yeah. that's my <laughs> dad's side of the family you know christmas day we're going over for gumbo and that's it's right it's easy there but then when i'm on a microphone it's just the muscle memory and i'll say do mm-hmm. and i'll you know i'll get an earful for that oh don't worry these shows have intros mm-hmm. I'm, I'm i'm spreading the do you love I love that. The only <laughs> thing is it's hard to Google, but everybody's staring at the script, you know, if they're know. listening to this. They already see it spelled. It's just that when I'm on a stage on a, with a microphone, I need them to Google the name. You know, they go, <laughs> go find me on Spotify. So right. might as well say do haunt so they got a chance at spelling it. You know, That's true. I, there's an H in there, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not a do, Y. At this point, do you do you write music first or do you write your lyrics first? Or does it like bounce back and forth? It's certainly back and forth yeah um, i think if if there is a musical idea that i dig then i'm gonna i'm gonna play it and you know kind of do the the sort of um meditative scatty mm-hmm. uh try to just pull something from the gut what does this feel like can i can i conjure up even just a line from my subconscious that this music is about yeah you know? And then if it's a line first, then then it's a little more, I think, um, what does this line feel like musically? And that that feels a little more technical and not as not as guttural. It's just, you know, is this sad? Should it be minor or should it be funky or uh, and then try not to be too on the nose. Try a few things, you know. Yeah, this might first feel like a straightforward rock kind of country folk song but what happens if i slow it down and just finger pick it is that more powerful you know just trying different stuff like that yeah mess with it get a little yeah. creative as it were yeah here's hoping i gotta say on the mornings uh gonna take a little rain and land rush are my favorites oh yeah that's great I, yeah i like them a lot they're yeah. real good i i uh happened to stop into a, a friend's yard sale the other day and she was playing my music nice she she had told me that so i was emotionally prepared for it already (laughs) it's Um, a good friend but i wanted to visit and boy oh boy i i will simply say this i heard it from i think it was the professor of poetry at harvard but she said if you read or in my case if you listen to your past work and it makes you uncomfortable or you're unhappy with it congratulations you have grown as an artist yeah that that's comforting because i have to tell you i i I love playing those two songs it's just you only get one chance it's one decision to make the track that is forever the reference of that song you know yeah Uh, it's it's not the song it's just one time you played that song back in 2003 yeah (laughs) and that is the track that everybody believes is the representation of the song but when I play it today, it feels so much truer to me because it involves everything that I've done or been since then, you know? Uh, yeah, it's, it's grown, ver- it's evolved. Yeah, absolutely. And so to hear it in what feels like an infantile state with decisions <laughs> I wouldn't have made had I heard it now, you know? Sure. It's, like, it's turn, that, turn that off. Give me a guitar. Hold on. This is how it's done. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Who's got an axe? Yeah. 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 How did your songs end up on the ranch? 
man, they kind of just reached out to me. Um, really? Talk about ears. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I still, in, in fact, we're just playing phone tag, but I expect <laughs> that I'll be uh, in a inside of a sync deal fairly soon, which is, you know, just folks who are shopping your songs to film and television. Yeah. But I have to say that generally that line hasn't been in the water for me for a, far too long. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a game of chance. So you really just, you totally. just got to have a line in the water. But what was cool is I didn't have a line in the water then. They just reached out to my personal email and uh, they, I think they synced three songs, Mm -hmm. which lucky for me at the time was just enough money to pay Eric Massey to track False River. So Um. it was basically like a tip drill of the money from ranch to me to Eric (laughs) to make a new record. But you got to love that, you know? That's the artist in you. It's like, all right, take the money from the art to make more art. Indeed. If yeah, well, um, it it can feel that way sometimes. And you know what feels really fortunate these days is when I go to the bar, I don't care what the beer costs anymore. That is so nice. <laughs> that means and you've made it. That's that, the goal. <laughs> man, I, I gotta say it, it it feels a little like without the enemy of comparison mm-hmm. and ambition will latch on to that element of comparison oh yeah all day right but Mm -hmm. without that i feel so lucky to be touring with guys i appreciate who dig this music who are the best players i've ever played with and we go into a room and people care man yeah the comparison part would say yeah but ambition would like it to be i don't know five times bigger seven 10 times bigger would be nice. I don't need to be the biggest songwriter in America or anything like that. I don't need that. I just want to be able to sell out, say, five to a thousand capacity theaters in 25 markets in the United States, you know, mm-hmm. um, and and that that'll feel great. But in the meantime, what I think the comparison will recognize in a lack of uh, a width in the in the fan base there is a depth in it that i can't deny and those are the folks who come up to you with those evangelical eyes and they tell you about a song that got them through a hard time or something you know Mm -hmm. and in in that way there's just no doubt in my mind that the drive to write the next song that i have today while the ones that are already written just exist. And maybe if I heard them, they would make me uncomfortable as tracks, but they exist for someone else. They're not for me anymore. You know, yeah. they're somewhere else. And they're, you know, my hope is that they're serving someone else. And that just makes it so easy to stare forward and try to write the best song I've ever written. Something that costs me the most to say, uh, what is that? And, and that's the question that I'm asking every day is what do I have to say? Um, because it is so special when it comes back around and, uh, and people let you know that some song you wrote a few years ago served them this past week or something, you know? Yeah. That's the beauty of art, right? Is that underlying human connection where like you're putting your heart out there and somebody yeah. else also being human mm-hmm. with, there is truth there. They're like, Oh, same. You're like ah, That's what it's about. Yeah. That's, that's what we're here for is that right there. We're all in this together. You say the right words, it can help someone through anything. Oh, and didn't, wasn't it, isn't it obvious to me now that my my love for what I like to call affectionately sad bastard songs. <laughs> um, I love it. That was about feeling less alone, just knowing that you're not the only one who goes through this, you know? Yes. Um, that is just so useful to all of us. And so- What else can you say or what story can you tell that could make someone feel less alone, you know? Yes, wholeheartedly agree. Was was your quarantine songs always meant to be an album? Not particularly. I, I, uh, yeah, I spent all of quarantine, you know, holed up in my room that I call the song cave. And love it. There were a bunch of guitars and uh, a bunch of half written tunes that I kept passing by to go get in the van again but now i couldn't get in the van and so there i was working on the half written songs and finished a bunch of them and uh 
to to share them, it felt clear that that making videos of them to share on YouTube was the right way to share them without touring being a possibility. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I had to create a series so that they all, you know, remained in their little collection. Of course. And then I could number them. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't feel like spending a whole lot of time on a name. So they just became the quarantine song <laughs> series. You got to forgive me for that one. It works. Um, it's up the time. <laughs> it is. But uh, was it supposed to be a record? I... I had a feeling once there was like 20 something of them that, that I'd, <laughs> I'd find a record in there somewhere, but I didn't feel like I was certainly wasn't going to call them the, it wasn't going to call it the quarantine record or anything like that. Yeah. That's smart. <laughs> yeah. That's the playlist. That's not the, that's not the record name. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it was clearly all coming from that place quite literally. Uh Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it felt like it was going to be its record. And we actually went into the studio, uh, you know, I don't know if it was 32 songs or something like that, Ooh. but uh, we recorded 18 of them, which as Ew. you say, you know, that those was high priced hours, but Trina was at the helm and uh, we had an, uh, an all-star band really because nobody was touring. So uh, this was when we, I can't remember. We all wore masks in the studio. Were we vaccinated? I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was either just before or just after we could be vaccinated. But uh, but we all wore masks in the studio. And so it, we were all very much not touring yet. Uh, it was John O'Ricks on drums. It was um, Miles Weeks on bass, Dan Walker on keys, and myself and Trina Shoemaker at the helm. Uh, but I remember the first day, we were wrapping up the last song project, you know, she's closing it down the session. It's probably 10 30 or 11 and everybody's tired. And she swings her chair around and looks at all of us and says, okay, well, want to go for another one? And I, I, <laughs> I think we all kind of hitched up feeling like, Oh, Oh, she's putting us to work. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I, I mean, it's my record. I'm, I'm all for it, you know, but she, I think she kind of sent us uh, on a journey and we didn't record a record. We recorded a record and a half, you know, only 11 of those songs became the record Emerald Blue. So there's mm-hmm. seven sitting around and I'll figure out whether they're going to be on the next thing or what, but that was quite the session. And I don't think that'll ever happen again, not only because everybody's going to be touring, but uh, I don't think we'd get four people to record 18 songs in four days. <laughs> wow. How do you decide how many songs go on a record? Is there a number that like it has to reach to be classified? Oh, that's a good. Well, you, if you call it an EP, you can put three songs on there, right? Okay. But if it's a record, an LP, I think it's determined by how many you can fit on a vinyl if you're trying to press oh, a vinyl. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So that's really important these days because there is such a markup with vinyl, right? Um, right. Maybe you spend seven to 10 bucks pressing your vinyl per unit and then you you sell it for 25 or 30 bucks Mm -hmm. and with the cd you know it's probably half of that profit margin but anyway if you know if you're pressing vinyl you certainly want to stick to those sorts of numbers back when everybody was making cds people were coming out with 15 track records right but i i think people are are trying to make vinyl these days and so you might as well stick to the 10 to 12 track record gotcha i didn't know that there's a there's a technical physical side of it. Like, well, how many can you fit on this particular record? <laughs> yeah, it's certainly a consideration. Huh. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of Emerald Blue. I love the whoops at the beginning of Castle and Irish Bayou. Thank you. It's it's so good. I'm like, I love that that's in there. <laughs> it was my decision to keep it in, you know. Trina took good me for it was you. obviously was, was in the, the initial board mix. And then Trina sends me her mix and it's out. And I said, you know, what if we leave it in? Yeah. Every now and again, I get a good idea. You know, it's generally <laughs> trains ideas. And... Right. It takes four albums. It happens one. That's right. Yeah, that, exactly right. It's the only one I got. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that that tune was the tune that was clever and not true on that record. That is, that's the uh, palate cleanser, uh, comic relief sort of song. And for that reason, I think it was good to intro it with something super casual, you know. Yeah, it's fun. Was that your dog in the video? That's our dog. Uh, it, uh, initially, Carissa's dog, uh, my girlfriend. But now I can say I'm, I'm, you know, I am the dad by 
by rights, sure. I would say. Yeah. So what's his name? His name is Marty. Marty. Good name. He'd definitely been in a boat before. He had. Yeah, absolutely. He had. <laughs> he, he spent uh, three years up in Moses Lake, Washington. And uh, so there was a boat up there that he would he'd, uh, hang out in. And yeah, he's 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 got his sea legs somewhat. Bayou legs, anyway. Yeah, his bayou le- his Irish bayou legs. Indeed, yes. <laughs> Which are like regular sea legs, except his top half doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. How tough was it getting that last shot? Because water moves, and you're in a boat, and you're in front of the castle, and you're you're directly in front of it. Mm-hmm. And from a technical side, I looked at it, I'm like, okay, how? how? We, we got to give a shout out to Cameron Gott on this one who shot that video. He, um, he is someone who, as a creative, will run through walls for his ideas. And Hell yeah. um, he just he just goes and gets it. It is without fear that he creates. And it is because he's come from not the easiest life, I am sure. Yeah. But he was the one who flew down from Dallas. Dude. And just just did a great job. He was in a separate canoe with Miles. And they, they were behind me in my canoe. And Miles just stuck his paddle in the mud and kind of, you know, stationary. Oh. <laughs> but but it, it was blowing, man. It was seriously blowing that day. So if I wasn't paddling with the wind, it was a struggle. And we had that that love seat on the uh, on the canoe, which was acting like a sail. Mm-hmm. So I was working pretty hard to get to the, <laughs> you know, the windward side of the bayou and then just, you know, slowly come back and, and get that footage. But that was a day. Ooh, my goodness. I got to say, you know, it's not a competition, but my favorite song out of all the music that you've put out thus far is Southpaw. Oh, man, that's great. Yeah. I Dude. um, Yeah. Thanks for hearing it. I I would agree that. Oh, OK. If I, if I have to pick a tune, that one is as truthful as I have written. No doubt. You know, um, that one has cost me as much as any song. And I, I love to play it. You know, I love that people are kind of finding it because it's yeah. not it's not the first one that the the usual first listen to a record. It's probably not the one that sticks out, you know, mm-hmm. on first listen. You know, there's some feeling of the onion that probably has to happen. Sure. But but I yeah, I appreciate you hearing that one. And, and it's certainly one of my favorites. I've been looping it for like two weeks. Nice. You talk about you love imagery, that imagery of a left handed outlaw. I was like, I out the gate. I'm like this. This is a song for me. Yeah. I just I love it. It's beautiful. The imagery, left-handed love letters, just because left hands, you do the ink is wet. I'm like, oh, there's so much going on in that song that it is. It is poetry. That's what it is. Thanks, man. Thanks for hearing it. I absolutely love it. So, out of all the songs, is that the one you would say like you're most proud of? Uh, it would be. I, I'd probably there was probably three ish. That being one. Yeah. Just another beautiful girl is certainly a song that I think you throw a dart and sometimes it lands somewhere important, whether you meant it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think I meant it subconsciously. And that was because a friend of mine's mother asked me that day why I didn't write more songs about Jesus. Oh, <laughs> which is, you know, the kind of question that you, you probably black out when you're answering. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what I told her, but but I went home and I wrote this story of an interracial young couple problematic to their to their hometown because not only because they were interracial, but because they were young. Yeah. But I think I think that was me trying to answer that question. Why am I not writing about Jesus? Why am I not completely enthralled in my my Catholic upbringing? I think it's because we don't even know any black people. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. We don't know the people around us and and you want to know why I don't know this Jesus guy mm-hmm. or why I'm not proclaiming his name. I think it's because we we have so much right here that we don't talk about enough and and so that that's what came out and I'm glad it did because it continues to be a song I'm glad to play. Yeah. Is there when you're doing when you're making your sets now, do you have a song that's like particularly fun to play? Let's see. You know, what's fun? I, is it, I don't know if it's any, if there's anything more fun than playing songs like Southpaw. Right? I'm totally biased. <laughs> I, 
Well, it, you know, and it's not particularly a, a fun tune, you know, it's not up tempo or anything. It's just, it's almost like we've managed to create this reasonably mid to up tempo set, mm -hmm. but it's all in an effort to create a dynamic shift so that when we play a song that's down like Southpaw, that it is a moment, you know? Yeah. So to me, even though in the 90 minute set, 80 of it is mid to up tempo, it's all in an effort to make songs like Southpaw more powerful when they happen, you know? Cultivating the experience for the stick in the landing. Yeah. Yeah. And it, like the more that you offer that space, you know, like a solo show. Yeah. There, well, that, that space abounds, you know, and it's, but eventually it can just get sleepy. Right. Because it's all mellow and it's all spacious. But if you can use counterpoint to, you know, do some, some flourishing, faster tempo stuff and then drop into that spacious place, it, I think it can, you know, it, it's just a, that's the joy of playing is, is those moments. Even, even if the crowd's a little chatty. Sure. You get to that point, you know, it's a, it's a, you used to think that you played louder when they were chatty, but then they just talk louder. <laughs> right. <laughs> now what you do is you drop it way, way down and see if they have the balls to be chatty then, you know. There you go. And oftentimes they, everybody is quiet. It's a beautiful thing. That's cool. Creating like a real moment in space. Mm -hmm. Right on. So do you have like, do you have any advice for up and coming musicians? Sure. Let's see. No one else can write your songs. Mm. I think that was an important thing that I was told. And I, I use that to hearken to the idea of co-writing, which is important. And I think we all should try mm -hmm. and, and maybe we focus on it if that's what feels right. But no one else can write your song and you can use that as comfort with the idea that other people can do their thing. Um, and it might even seem akin to your thing, but everyone has a story. And if you can tell yours, you will have singular golden, you know, intellectual property if you want to get with the business term terminology stuff, but mm -hmm. that's it. You know, like whatever it is that, you know, your story no one else can write that. And then to continue that, uh, George Howard from Loyola told me an important piece of advice when it lends itself to ego, and that is to never be jealous of someone else for getting their piece of the pie because the pie is too vast and no one can get your piece. So Ooh. when when your colleagues have, have success, if you ever feel that little jealous bone leaking in, or you think, how did they get booked to that for that festival? We do way better for that festival. You know, now, now, I think there's so much more opportunity to uplift each other and deny those sorts of uh, selfish ego veins to tell us that somehow we're failing or we're floundering because someone else was successful before or in another way that we were not, you know. That's beautiful. I mean, comparison is the thief of joy. Mm -hmm. There's a space for everybody. I like that a lot. And I, so I didn't plan this, but it just so happened that this episode's going to drop on the 24th, which I know is your first tour date. Oh, nice. Of your new tour and tour. You got a tour coming up. Indeed. What's going on? Where's your head at? How you feeling? Oh, man. I mean, great. You know, yeah. as long as the van runs good, the fellas yeah. <laughs> inside it are good. That would be my only concern really these days. I, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, I feel fortunate in many ways and, and, it almost feels like I'm, I'm like riding a certain wave, uh, not to stardom, but just what would have happened if I was five years earlier in my career and I had no real proven or 10 years earlier, I had no real proven benchmarks uh, that I had reached by the quarantine. Yeah. What did, what did the artists do who were, who were after some unproven venture? Yeah. Did they have to give it up because they just didn't have an opportunity to try? I feel for folks like that because I was afforded an opportunity to sit down and write and know that's what I was supposed to be doing then. Mm -hmm. but what about people who didn't think that would necessarily make them any money after the quarantine? And so they had to not write songs, but find a job on Zoom or something because there was no way to make money songwriting. You know, little pieces like that, it just... 
I feel really lucky to be able to write songs and make money doing that, you know? So, and, and as for the upcoming tour, trying to actually answer your question directly, <laughs> um, it feels, it feels like we're starting to sell tickets to shows cool. uh, in, in real ways, you know, a few sellouts here and there, you know, we're not selling out every city or anything like that, or we're not selling out huge rooms, but people are starting to pay attention enough that they, when we come to their town, they buy tickets. And uh, as you, you know, without comparison, what else could you possibly ask for? I love that. There's a, I, I can, I can hear the, the, the gratitude mm -hmm. in your voice. And I think I, I've always loved supporting artists who have that sort of heart first. So I'm really, really excited for you and the band and this, this upcoming tour. I, it's going to be pretty cool. I think. I hope so. And you know what? We'll get down to Florida. We just, I've been having this Key West or bust attitude about getting through the uh, the old Southern Peninsula. Yeah. Um, but we used to we used to get down to Key West. We used to play the smoking tuna and the green parrot, and of course, uh -huh. you know, stop along the way. But uh, yeah, I kind of haven't made it down through the Florida route um, in a while. But maybe up maybe upcoming. You know. There you go. I'll keep it warm for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just like that, Andrew, we've been talking for over an hour. You survived. Amazing. We're here. Look at you. Dude, this was a blast. Same. Like, I'd have, I had a feeling I was going to enjoy you, but you you exceeded all of my expectations. <laughs> I'm glad for that. That sounds great. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate your questions because, uh, you know, I, I obviously appreciate your free form, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that all, uh, always makes me wonder where we're going to go. But thanks for going there. Of course, of course. Now, before I release you back to the wild, I got to ask, where can people find you? Where can they find your stuff? Upcoming tour dates? Talk to mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Um, AndrewDuhon.com is probably the best place to go, certainly for tour dates. Um, you sign up for the newsletter. I'll keep you posted on, uh, you know, when the next record's coming out, that sort of stuff. You can find all the videos on YouTube. Um, Facebook and Instagram are useful for the, you know, the... Uh, periodical updates, videos, uh, shows in your area, that sort of thing. I, I would also say bands in town. If you're not on there, not just for me, but any bands that you dig, I find bandsintown.com to be really useful. Ooh. They basically just email you when the bands you dig are coming to your town. That's it. Oh, genius. That's all they do. And so I use bands in town to schedule, to, to list my entire tour. So if I'm coming to your neck of the woods and you have me as one of your bands in town artists, it'll shoot you an email. That simple. Wow. So you don't even have to follow me. You forget <laughs> all about me. You know? I love it. Andrew, you're the best. Ah, back at you. This is great fun. Hey. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.